thank you so much, Dr. Daniel Lee, and for your response. And thank you, uh, Dr. Kim, for your presentation. You both have given us uh, much to consider as we try to embody the full gospel of Jesus Christ. Dr. Kim, before we begin fielding questions and engaging in more conversation, I wanna give you the opportunity uh, to say a few words now that you've heard Dr. Lee's response to your work. I wanted to make sure that you had an opportunity to say a few things before we jump into uh, questions that are coming in and, and further dialogue, Dr. Kim. Okay, thank you. Um, first, I want to thank Dr. Lee um, for his comments, for responding to my talk. I seriously could not have asked for a better respondent on the subject. It's so true. I mean, he's the Dean of the Center for Asian American Theology Ministry. He actually teaches classes on Asian American identity, ministry, theology. So, wow, you know, and he is in fact, one of the Asian American Christians making their mark in the greater American Christian landscape. So I want to thank you again. Um, all right, so now let me address his comments. First, as we have both noted, I want to reiterate that we can't understand Asian American Christianity and Asian American Christians contribution to American Christianity without first understanding Asian Americans history of exclusion, discrimination and erasure in US society. Even today, their stories and history are not part of the mainstream curriculum or even the side stream curriculum at various Christian institutions, mine included. And efforts to do so are being challenged by the current administration as we speak. So I absolutely agree with Dr. Lee that many Asian Americans lack the social historical contextual literacy to identify themselves, let alone imagine their contribution in the broader landscape. So thank you for that. And second, as Dr. Lee pointed out, if any kind of conversation that we have about Asian American Christians has to be attuned to their diversity, heterogeneity, multiplicity within the, the diversity, multiplicity, heterogeneity within the community. For example, when we talk about Asian American Christians, who are we talking about really? Are we talking about evangelicals? Are we talking about mainline Catholic? And depending on who we talk about, and of course, what groups within that group we're talking about, we're gonna tell a different story about Asian American Christianity, theology, ministry, identity, et cetera. So that's very true. Asian Americans are also diverse, very obviously, in their ethnicity, culture, nationality, generation, mode of entry, class, status, and to be frank, little unites them besides their monolithic racialization as Asians. Moreover, there are significant power inequalities within the community, it's true. As Dr. Lee suggested with the overdominance, if you wanna look at just Asian American evangelicalism with Korean American evangelicalism, it's true. Right, in terms of the culture structure of Asian American evangelicalism and even the study of Asian American evangelicals. It's absolutely the case. Uh, third, given my above point, there is the constant danger of essentializing Asians, Asian Americans in whole or in part. Although ethnographers, sociologists like myself charged with telling the stories of these particular communities, uh, you know, although we are ethnographers, you know, telling the stories of these communities, we have to be aware of the reality that the story that we tell is just one story among Mary, various other stories that we could tell. And that even that one story that we do tell that there's multiple stories within that single story. So I thank Dr. Lee for his words of caution in this regard, right? We certainly do not want to essentialize the cultures that we study. So thank you again. And on a related note, as Dr. Lee State asked in response to my characterization of the Asianization of the Christian, uh, California Christian landscape, how do we escape the use of the category Asians, originally Asiatics, a monolithic orientalist political term that was imposed by the, on, on this heterogeneous community by the majority in power. How do we, what, what alternative terms could we use that counters this external labeling of Asians as the exotic monolithic foreign other, which during the ongoing pandemic, we feel ex especially, right, uh, intensely. And finally, besides the characterization of Asians as perpetual foreigners and yellow peril, the other major form of Asian American racialization, uh, including Asian American Christians, is their positioning as model minorities. Good minorities who remain quiet, work hard, and in, sense, in essence, do not challenge white supremacy. 
On this note, I want to clarify that I am not suggesting that Asian American Christians can serve as these keys to a multiracial cultural uh, church future in the Christian community as these good, safe uh, model minorities who will do the hard work of racial reconciliation on behalf of white folks. No, but I do want to communicate that their experiences of liminality and marginality uh, provide them with an outsider's perspective, a third lens, if you will, and ability to connect with diverse multiple communities. While their cultural liminality it will certainly vary given generational differences and the reality of the overwhelming pull of assimilation, Asian Americans are hit by white supremacy, albeit differently, like other people of color. On this note, and trying to kind of wrap it up on a positive note, uh, positive note, I want to give a shout out to the Asian American Christian Collaborative, a social movement in the making as we speak to help formulate Asian Americans voice, identity and action in the American Christian landscape and beyond. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rebecca Kim. Thank you so much. I, I'd like to um, riff from where you started. You mentioned this ability to connect. And I think there was something in, in, in the presentations that both you and Dr. Lee made that for me are major points of, of connection. Part of the way inclusion and exclusion works, right, is it's about alienating the experiences of the other. It's, it's about saying that that experience is foreign, it's different, it's other, it's strange. But there are so many overlapping experiences that I, as a black man, as I'm listening to the presentations, when I hear about the lynching of Chinese bodies, when I hear about the burning of, of a Chinese center of dwelling and commerce, all of this rings with, with Oklahoma race riots. It rings with Jim Crow. So I know what that language of lynching and burning uh, means and does for me as somebody who lives and dwells in a black body. But how do you hear and experience those events in your particular context? And this might even be uh, the point where Dr. Lee talks about an inability to describe our own context or our own experience. Um, maybe Dr. Lee, if you want to jump in, how do you experience that? How do you hear that? How does that, how does that impress upon you? Maybe the uh, affect of it. I think in that sense, um, Dr. Affleck, it's important to uh, recall that Asian American movement, uh, you know, that's 50 years old, uh, started and, and uh, the idea of performing blackness was was a very significant part because how do you kind of understand Asian Americanness? Well, back then, 50 years ago, the, people had no idea how to do this thing. They knew that they were going to react to whiteness, but they had no idea how to actually make sense of it. So what they did, I mean, it's, this is a direct direct connection, right? Genealogical connection to Black Power, Black Panthers, where Asian Americans, I mean, they were literally being mentored by Black Panthers, right? So they were trying to figure out, how do we make sense of this thing? We know we're not white, and we don't actually know what the other category is, but how do you get to Asian Americanness, right? So they, they did this by performing earlier on Blackness and, and kind of try it on saying, well, how do we make sense of this thing? And then you get to a place where they kind of develop this kind of Blackness, right? I mean, black, uh, develop this Asian Americanness. That history is pretty much like lost altogether. What's interesting is that a lot of Asian Americans in this particular time, they're doing the exact same thing, right? Because they don't, a lot of Asian Americans who don't understand Asian American history, like the 50 years of it, they don't understand that. So they say, okay, we know we're not white. We're trying to make some sense of what it means to be a racial minority. So therefore, we're going to actually learn from, you know, black scars, which all of us should. But they, after a while, realize that's not exactly us. So how do we get to this other place? I think in that sense, you know, and there's no denying the fact that, uh, you know, the African American community have been the racial ancestors, right? That, that language is actually very significant, I think, for Asian Americans and saying, how do we kind of understand what it means to be Asian American racial minorities? Um, and through that, through that uh, performative kind of space, Asian Americans have developed, that space, Asian Americans' uh, identity has, have developed, right? So that's one of the reasons why so much of it resonates, because there's a genealogical connection. And to some degree, I think that connection has to be recalled for us to properly make sense of what it means to be Asian American. I mean, otherwise, it, it you know, without history, we have no idea who we are. And when we recall Asian American history, immediately you end up with uh, this idea, this, this uh, connection uh, to uh, to Black Power, Black Panthers, and, and, and the Black movement altogether. 
So that's one of the reasons why I think, uh, you know, uh, for people who are informed, they make that connection. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Dr. Kim. I, when you asked that question, I mean, I just felt it in my heart because I, even my desire, my initial, you know, the reason why I got into sociology, studying immigration and race is after reading various African-American scholars, James Baldwin, Ralph Ellison, Invisible Man, and, and Malcolm X, and just feeling this pain, this pain, this sorrow, especially as a Christian, this American history of racism and discrimination and slavery, it just hurt me so much. And at the same time, while it hurt me, it, it, it part of the reason why I think it hurt me so much in the soul is because I could connect to it in part, being, an estra being a stranger, being marginalized, being othered. And this really kind of somewhat hit home for me too when I had a conversation with a white American friend who also studies race. Uh, and, and I asked her, doesn't it hurt so much? Because I actually get to be honest, somewhat depressed, studying racism and inequality all the time. It's, it's not good for my social mental well-being. So I, I was sharing with my, my white friend that it, it's difficult me, for me sometimes emotionally to you know, process all this, even as an academic. And she said, you know, it, it hurts her too, but not in the same way because she said, it's not my problem. In the sense that, yes, she says, sees it as a social problem, but she doesn't feel it as a personal problem. But for me, as a woman of color, I feel it as a personal problem. And as a result of that, yes, it's, it's sad, it's difficult, but on the positive, I can help connect. Although my experience is different, but it's still an experience of marginalization, right? And othering and estrangement. So it helps me connect with the others who are experiencing, you know, being that a position in that way in society. So heartfelt. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kim. There are several questions coming through and I don't want to uh, dismiss them. Uh, let's let's uh, go with one question that asks. It says that the, you guys, you, you have both provided a careful description um, about the diversity within this larger kind of made up monolithic expression of Asian Americanness. But are there commonalities um, that somebody's asking, could you speak to some of the commonalities? And I think you've already started to unpack some of that in your lecture and even in just these, these answers here. But if some of you would, or if one of you would care to speak to, what are some of the commonalities that you see? Okay, so first one that immediately comes to mind is just this, this blanket categorization of it, you know, this Asianization, right? Creating this category for dozens of, you know, ethnicities saying, oh, you're all Asian. So that kind of reality, uh, the external labeling, right? Uh, that's commonality. And in fact, pan-ethnic Asian American scholars argue like, what really do we have in common? Besides this, right? Oh, you can say you, you guys are all from Asia. Yeah, but like our culture and histories and actually some of our histories are not very friendly with even one another, right? There's no ling linguistic commonality. So um, really this external labeling is one point of commonality. But if you wanna look at it, trying to generalize as, I mean, as a sociologist, you can say one commonality is that well, Asian Americans overall, just looking at them broadly, uh, they, are, they have a significant foreign born population. So oftentimes you may, I mean, although there's generational differences, right? We got third, fourth generation Japanese Americans. Uh, that is, uh, you know, a good number of Asian Americans do have that, uh, you know, the, the immigrant experience, not maybe as themselves, but maybe their parents, right? Grandparents. So that could be some form of connect, uh, you know, connection. Uh, and then uh, what, in regards to the Asianization, um, of course, the external labeling, but in everyday experiences. Now, this depends on the type of Asian American as well. So, for example, during the ongoing pandemic, East Asian Americans, it doesn't matter, you know, no one's going to say, are you Chinese first before saying, you know, anti, you know, uh, sign of, you know, xenophobic uh, comments directed, you know, with the Chinese flu and everything uh, on certain East Asians. So there's that uh, commonality in everyday life. But, um, and then if you look within particular communities, like Asian American Christianity, again, this is, you know, gross generalization. Oftentimes there's uh, conversations about more of a um, collective community, uh, family kind of um, um, importance of family and community relative to the kind of the white normative Christian culture that can bind certain Asian American Christian groups together that I've heard. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Yeah, uh, at the Asian American Center, we use this tool called the Asian American Quadrilateral. Uh, it's basically four different ways of uh, kind of meta categories, right? The fact that we share these meta categories and the four of them are Asian heritage, whatever it may be, you know, 
uh, we share some degree. And I mean, so all the diversity, these are meta categories, right? We share them very differently, but at the same time, they kind of we share them in some way. Uh, what generation they are, what, what part of the country or whatever. So Asian heritage, whatever it may be, some kind of a migration or post-migration experience. We came from somewhere and that actually has, uh, that itself is a category, uh, whether it be, you know, by immigration or whether it be refugee experience, there's, we came from somewhere somehow. Now these things all overlap and that's basically what makes it a unique experience, right? Because I mean, everybody came from somewhere <laughs> if you're not Native American or you might, uh, so in people in Asia have Asian heritage, but when you start overlapping them, you end up be, having a more unique experience. So Asian heritage, migration experience, it's basically like the fact that we, we share American culture, it's part of who we are, but also America, US as, as a whole kind of represents uh, and uh, sees us in a particular way. And this is very different if you're, you know, if you're Indian American, you, you're struggling with, you know, Abu and the Simpsons, right? I mean, or if you're Chinese American and you're talking about all the different kind of ways in which US or the president's kind of portraying China. So there's American culture and there's representation. What does it really look like? And then the last thing is racialization. I mean, that's just the state, right? The state puts this in our categories. How do we navigate that? So in this four sense, we all share it. How we experience and how we navigate that, uh, they're all different. But these meta categories, we all share together. And that's what makes us unique. And we live at the intersection of all these things, as you know, along with gender and, and all these other aspects that, that we actually make, that makes us per, uh, particular. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Another question is asking, and as we're talking about that cultural difference uh, and maybe even the American quote unquote experience, question is asking, um, You've mentioned uh, this bicultural edge. Dr. Kim mentions this bicultural edge. And someone's asking, could you offer some examples of how that, that edge is learned? And maybe what are some of the sociological and theological implications or conclusions? But bicultural edge, I was just trying to communicate that uh, the Asian American Christian leaders, the pastors that I interviewed as part of my study on race and leadership within the multiracial church, a lot of pastors share that one of the advantages, because they, they talked a lot about the challenges of leading as a person of color. But when I, uh, you know, could have asked them, you know, more specifically, but are there any kind of advantages to being a person of color leading this diverse congregation? And the one, one of the few advantages that um, several pastors <clears throat> talked about is this idea that have growing up in American society, pick part of because of the migration experience, right? Commonality in the uh, Asian heritage uh, commonality in America that Asian Americans have in common. Um, they're familiar with just traversing different spaces, knowing that in one, one context, you have to talk and act a certain way. And in another context, you have to talk and, you know, connect in a different way. Maybe you can call it code switching, culture switching, what have you, right? That's but what I was exactly thinking. Right. It's just part of how you are. So you just do it kind of not even within think without, you know, really kind of being conscious of it. And that uh, according to the Asian American pastors, uh, they found that this is helpful because in a multiracial church and multicultural church, they have to connect with a very diverse array of people. Um, I mean, one thing I would say is this, the fact that um, um, I do find um, the idea of biculturality to be helpful as long as we're not forgetting the racial dimension, because sometimes, you know, because obviously this is one of the stereotypes, right? The, especially from an evangelical kind of Christian perspective that race doesn't, I mean, this is not so many evangelical Christian spaces, but just in general, race isn't an Asian American thing, right? It's like, that's not your issue. It's basically how people talk about it. And they say, well, your issue is really Confucianism or whatever, right? It's like your cultural problem. And that's a way in which we, because the idea is the fact that you're not even real American, so why would race be a, be a real issue? Right. And that that idea is so deeply entrenched that a lot of times when we talk in Christian spaces, they like to talk about the heritage. They like to talk about the cultural aspect of it. I mean, obviously, you know, Dr. Kim's talking about bi-rack culturality in this history of racialization and exclusion. But not many people think that way when they say uh, biculturality, they just mean, well, they have two different, you know, you're you have this white American culture, you have this Asian heritage, you navigate it both. That's, I think, a very superficial way of thinking about it. And that's very common. So that's actually one of the things that we have to be, be careful about. Um, and because once again, culture is a lot easier. Ethnicity is a lot easier to talk about than race. And especially in evangelicalism, Asian Americans, 
that's your, racial is not even your issue anyways. So therefore, let's talk about culture, which is a huge problem, by the way. Um, second of all, I would say a lot of Asian American pastors that I interact with, they actually don't have language. They grew up with this context. So when they think about bicultural, they literally will spit out the same thing that they've absorbed, right? Saying, oh, well, race is not a big issue for me because this is basically, I mean, they might feel it, but they really can't articulate it. Right. I'm sure you've, Dr. You Kim, you found this as well. Their, their vocabulary and articulating racial uh, realities for, for themselves is very, very low, right? Because you have to learn this stuff. Um, I would say in terms of navigating, uh, does code switching, and I've kind of d- done research on this and written about it, that code switching can be an expression of a fragmented self. Like, you know, it, it can be actually, it can be caused by, um, microaggressive trauma in a sense, right? Where you're kind of switching back and forth, unable to integrate yourself. So that can be good, but also can be just a survival mechanism. And, that, and there's a d- dimension that we have to kind of be careful about. Now, I would say the positive element, because there's a positive element here. I mean, just in terms of, I think in all these different things, even though I think there are serious problems that we've kind of worked work toward, there is this dimension of kind of having interpersonal awareness, whether it be heritage, or whether it be just because you're, you're trying to navigate all these different spaces, just being really aware of what's happening, right? You know, who's speaking a lot, who's not speaking a lot, just seeing the space. I mean, in Korean American context, we call it, we, we, we call it nunchi. But I think in general, a lot of Asian Americans have to develop it for survival. And that actually can be very beneficial um, for ministry. Of course, we just want to make sure that uh, we attend to these kind of uh, racial trauma realities as well. Yeah. yeah, I want to add to that on that point that the, uh, so in my paper, I talk about it as not a cultural competency only, but a racialized cultural competency because it's layered intersects with their, their being able to see that white supremacy and racialization and racism. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both. If, if I can sw- switch gears slightly here and talking specifically about Christian mission, um, can you um, can you unpack uh, and, and speak to. Uh, this concept that you mentioned, especially um, in your um, in your session, uh, Dr. Kim, about the extremes of assimilation, of extremely being able to extreme extremely assimilate, or being able to or having an inability to assimilate, what impact might that have on on Asian American Christian mission? The ability to either blend in or being seen as somebody who will never be able to blend in, might there be some ramifications there for Christian mission specifically? Well, I know in the, just not Asian American, but the Korean mission literature, there's been some talk about Korean missionaries in the global, you know, setting, uh, being able to have an advantage of the traditional, you know, white European uh, colonialist, colonialist associated missionaries because, you know, they're not white, for example. And so they will be better able to connect with the people that they want to, um, you know, evangelize. Also that as um, a colonized country, having experienced, you know, turmoil for centuries, um, um, you know, in relation to more powerful countries that they also understand oppression as a people, which will again, help them to connect with the people that they want to evangelize. Now, of course that's been critiqued and saying, well, especially South Korea, they have their own brand of, of imperialism and you know they go out there with pomp and power saying we are now growing economic political military power and so you must kind of listen to us and our christianity and so it's problematic in that way but the potential is there because you can say hey we're somebody new and we can possibly connect right based on our history experiences uh to you and, and to share the gospel yeah so the key is the key is self-knowledge and awareness if that is not there, I mean, you know, I mean, Dr. Kim knows the fact that some of the Korean Americans are literally exporting Korean, Korean Christianity, like making people do early morning prayer, like in the middle of Africa. I'm like, is this what they should be doing, right? So, I mean, unless you're really aware of the colonial dynamic, you literally can't, you basically fall into that, that, you know, the exact same dynamic and you basically do it to other people. And then that's something what we're seeing. I mean, if you talk to like uh, our Korean Studies Center, they, they, they've researched this and saying, this is actually one of the big issues. How do we actually make sure that you have self-awareness in terms of what's happening and historical awareness, the fact that this has been done, this has actually been done by the West, Western powers. It doesn't mean that you're gonna not repeat it well, you only don't repeat it if you actually understand it, right? Um, I think when I when I talk to Asian American missionaries, I mean, once again, 
they are going out there and they're making sense of it, uh, you know, whether they're you know in the middle of Asia or Africa or what, Europe or whatever. I mean, because they still lack so much self knowledge, they really can't make sense of what's happening. Right. So, and that can be, I mean, this is a faulty way of doing it saying, well, you know, it doesn't matter because we're of the world. I mean, we're not of the world. We're basically, we belong to heaven, which basically makes, erases all the history and makes us even more ignorant. Right. But we super, super, super spiritualize those things as a way of kind of being colorblind or whatever. So I think that idea of understanding yourself well, especially as Dr. Kim has pointed out, it's just not in the curriculum. It's not in the curriculum, not. In the curriculum anywhere. I mean, even, spirit in the call. Yeah, anywhere, right? It's just not, I mean- And that the, curriculum is evil, Dr. Lee. It is, it is. It is. The curriculum, I mean, so this is basically what we, we would say that so much of the Asian American uh, 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 Christians and missionaries have absorbed kind of a, a, a colonized mentality. And in that sense, it doesn't really serve them that well. Right, they actually there's another set of skills, or even in terms of how they see themselves, is through this vocabulary, which which isn't going to serve them that well. I mean, it doesn't mean that everything's bad. Obviously, there's so much of it, but a lot of times it distorts their reality. Like, this is how I always describe it. Like the white, you know, uh, uh, vocabulary that we learn overlaps with our experience. So, but what do you do with the side that doesn't overlap? And also, even the side does overlap, it distorts the Asian American experience. Right, so. Uh, because we are the instruments ourselves. We are the message. If we don't understand who we are, it becomes very dangerous. Mm-hmm. And this is basically where we are right now. So so how do um, Asian American Christians uh, go about developing their identity? How do they go about recovering these narratives, um, connecting with other cultural and racial and socioeconomic experiences outside of their immediate context? Good question. This is what I would say. I mean, I think this is basically what I realized. At Fuller, people say, uh, people say it's such a diverse place to learn about everybody else. But the only problem with that is, is that's actually a white normal way of talk, what normative way of talking. A lot of people don't know themselves because their education was pretty much white normative. To tell them learn about somebody else. It doesn't really help when they have they know so little about themselves, and I think a lot of I mean Dr. Kim would agree. A lot of Asian Americans think, "Well, I know because I have a you know I have an Asian parent and I go to Asian church." I'm like, "No, you actually have no critical knowledge of what that is. That you have to actually learn. You have to actually be taught those things. And unless you actually are taught those things, you're not going to know. I mean, a lot of Asian Americans think that they know because okay, well, I spent twenty of my thirty years of my life, you know, as, as, uh, interacting with Korean Americans, and they're, and they're terrible or whatever. And I'm like, you really have no history and no knowledge, and that actually has to be learned. Otherwise, there's just no way of navigating this thing. So we need to make calls. So we make these, you know, histories, right? Institutions even teach it. I mean, I teach at Pepperdine. It's uh, one of, you know, top 50 school of among the Christian liberal arts colleges. It's supposed to be great, but it's, we don't have, we don't even have a class on Asian American history, let alone, you know, Chinese history, Chinese American history. So it's, we have institutional barriers, right? Therefore, one way to go about it is to, you know, make demands on this kind of curriculum, right? diverse curriculum. And also I want to point out that especially amplified during the pandemic is that we have multiple open a new world of ways that we can find out about, explore about Asian American identity, uh, Christianity, theology, right? Like like the Asian American Christian collaborator that I mentioned, like various Zoom sessions you can attend for free here and there, you can explore. So there is that positive, but we have to make calls for institutional changes so that this kind of curriculum conversations can be had. Yeah, I mean, I just want to add the fact that the Asian American Center has been doing this, right? We actually developed these things. Fuller's invested over, over a decade. And because we realized it wasn't going to be easy. It wasn't going to be easy theoretically to understand these things. So that's basically why I offer these classes. And, and we have multiple classes. We're one of the very few seminaries where we have multiple classes that's offered every year, which is like unheard of, right? So, and because I think what distinguishes what, uh, what we do uh, and this, I think, I think Dr. Kim will appreciate this, is that we actually have deep uh, overlap and we draw from Asian American studies, which is very rare for Asian American Christian seminaries to kind of, you know, seminaries kind of uh, teach Asian American classes. A lot of them, they actually have no understanding of Asian American studies or Asian American psychology. And we interact with both. 
Uh, I mean, we, people talk about the dearth of like Asian American literature out there. I'm like, there's too much. You just don't understand the fact that there's such thing as Asian American studies and Asian American psychology. I can't even get a handle on it. It's so much, right? But, but uh, Dr. Lee, on that note, I want to point out that especially in the evangelical circles, that's the, that's the devil's toolkit. Like, you know, Asian American studies, ethnic studies, that's where all the secular Marxists are, you know, telling and spinning their stories. And then psychology, we don't need psychology. All we need is the, you know, gospel. So there are barriers, but it, absolutely, there's a whole wealth of knowledge there, albeit secular, that can help uh, Asian Americans to understand their history. Definitely. Yeah, and, and I would say this is a time when actually this is actually opening up, right? Because when the evangelical label doesn't serve us anymore, what does that really mean? And I've kind of mentioned this. The fact that, you know, does it really make sense to kind of draw this evangelical in mainline? When in fact, we might have, some Asian American Christians might have a lot more similarity with mainline sisters and brothers than our white evangelical, right? So at this point, and even Marxism, we can you can talk about Marxism all you want to, but I'm like, if you look at historically, the only one resisting racism were the Marxists. That's one of the reasons why they align with them, right? So I think when you recall this history, it's not as crazy radical as it makes it out to be, but you have to be taught these things. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we have this boogeyman idea of Marxism. I'm like, capitalism, racism, <laughs> and imperialism all <laughs> went together, right? Only the Marxists were like, that's crazy. Yeah. Now, the Marxism had problems, of course. But I think to kind of lump it all together and say these Asian American uh, uh, scholars were all crazy and they're all radicals, I mean, I think that's, that's you know, as you and I know, that's part of the legacy, right, that we kind of absorbed. But that's something we have to undo. Otherwise, we're not going to understand U.S. as a context with our hidden imperialism or, or just, just the deep roots of racism and how it overlaps with capitalism as well. Yeah. Thank you both. We're, we're, we're nearing the end of our time here and at the risk of, of doing something that we cautioned against doing. Uh, but I do want to I do want to get to this question. Um, and the question is, are there ways or do you see ways that that um, the specifically Korean immigrant Christianity is influencing other AAPI groups? Or even just other ethnic groups in general? Well, I think obviously the initial uh, response to that question is be, given their uh, size and cloud, you know, in terms of like the number of churches and the organizations and the money behind their church and institutions and missions organizations, um, their, their, their presence is obviously going to be felt in the Asian American Pacific Islander community and beyond. So that's an easy response. Um, what kind of influence that they're providing, you know, you know, you know, bringing out there to the broader society, that's another question, but no doubt that you know, their version of Christianity or Christianities is uh, affecting the broader community. Yeah. I, I, I actually am pretty concerned, actually, because I think a lot of Korean Americans and actually because I interact with a lot of Korean Americans, obviously. And I think Korean Americans have historically been oppressed for so long. We actually want to be allowed and we, we're quite loud and quite, you know, we're not like the sky silent people, but because we actually are not we're being, used to being marginalized historically, we want to take up a lot of space. Now, the problem is if you are actually the dominant group and you're taking up a lot of space and you're not representing other Asian Americans, especially when you're the only Asian American there, I think it, it's actually uh, incumbent upon you to actually, as Korean Americans, to make sure that we're actually helping and, and not monopolizing the whole space to make sure that we make Filipino Americans and Vietnamese Americans and Hmong Americans more visible. And I don't see this happening a lot because Asian Americans, once again, are Korean Americans, once again, are not learning about the broader Asian American context. And in what sense do they actually not only ethnically, but racially have a responsibility, right? And that's not happening unless you're like Dr. Kim and you actually study this stuff, right? You know, you have to understand in what sense we play a particular role. Otherwise, they'll be, you know, I mean, a lot of Korean Americans say, well, look, I was an immigrant and I'll be, now be American. And I'm like, that doesn't work that way, right? You are there because you're a minority, you're a racial minority. So what does that mean to own all the racial minority and own kind of our Asian American identity, right? Then you can say, oh, how am I representing myself as, an, as a racial minority and Asian American? And then you think about the whole Asian American context. That is not largely happening right now for a lot of Asian American Christians. And I think, I mean, they're, it's great the fact that they're owning the Korean Americanness. I'm like, but it's actually problematic if that's all they own because they literally might be the only Asian American who basically are there representing the whole Asian American community. And that's unfortunate. They're not really using their privilege well. 
And it's hard because as we just talked about, I mean, if they lack self-awareness and consciousness in their own history and identity, right, in the American, greater American global context, then how can they even speak on behalf of other Asian Americans and other racialized people and discriminated people when they are also not aware? So maybe ending on a positive, it's a call to be more self-aware of yourself and your location, your positionality in the American Christian context and beyond, and then help others to join, right? Yes. Amen. Amen. And amen. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Rebecca Kim. Thank you so much. Those were great words. Uh, Dr. Daniel Lee, thank you so much. Uh, it is 12 uh, 23 and we have uh, we need to wrap up now and then our next session will start. Let me just say again, I have thoroughly enjoyed um, just sitting in the room uh, as part of maybe a fly on the wall in this conversation. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Kim and Dr. Lee. 